And both the black and the white car there together. It's a huge effort. We're talking 900 horsepower and an electronically limited top speed of 340 kilometers per hour. That's really... Wow, guys. I have to be very careful with the gas pedal because it's unbelievably... I'm standing there in Fuerteventura in the dust and wondering how my father would have reacted to the 6x6. I remember when I first saw the 6x6 in its final form. While we were in Fuerteventura for testing and the video shoot. Because today we have to ask this question. Where are the right landscapes to really put the 6x6 to the test and find out what you can do with it? Where are the limits of this vehicle? My goal is to make sure we don't lose sight of our brand essence. So I'm not going to start making slapstick videos. For me, it's important that our brand comes across authentically. Is the car on the right terrain? Does it belong there? Or does it look out of place? Like driving a 6x6 on a racetrack. We're not doing that. It seems as if there's no civilization. That's the feeling we want to convey. Unexplored territory. Especially the landscape with the ocean, the stony desert. Like you said, that was such a cool image. And both the black and the white car there together. I also thought all the action footage with Lance driving through the desert was spectacular. What used to always be trips to the trade fairs are now, to a certain extent, the events where we test the vehicles and, of course, try to combine with shooting the videos. So really, a work trip like Fuerteventura, or think of last year at Rosh al Khaima in the desert with a crawler. Rosh al Khaima or Dubai with a 1300R. Exactly. You've got marketing and sales, but also engineering there, because we accompany the cars to the events to make sure everything goes smoothly. Yeah, and a crew like that and everything else you need. Sometimes it's 30, 40 people that make up the team. You need a driver who drives the car. You need a camera vehicle. Maybe camera crane that needs to be operated. All the equipment involved. Drones, drone pilots, so lots of stuff. You need catering for a team like that. Everything needs to be organized. Of course, we sometimes hire external help, but the main crew comes from us. Already travel-wise, it's a huge effort. Usually we go to more southern regions with our cars, but now we're in Austria. A bit different for ones because, well, we have a very special car with us. The Brabus 900 Rocket R, based in the Porsche 911 Turbo S. And seriously, one of the sexiest cars we've ever built. And we said, okay, where would you want to drive a car like that? And we started thinking, Alpine passes. Of course, you could also drive through beautiful, sunshiny Italy, but you really want to drive into some curves with this kind of car and have some fun. So that's why we came to the gorgeous Countertal and more or less rented a mountain there. We actually had root sections cordoned off because the Rocket R was still only a prototype, not launched yet. So of course we didn't want the car to be photographed. This is a 35 kilometer stretch, but we don't want to drive all of it. We chose specific sections and cordoned those off and filmed there. The nice thing was, we arrived at a location during scouting, and I'll never forget it. All of a sudden, someone drove past in a Porsche 911. And you knew immediately, they're not there coincidentally. They want to do exactly what we have in mind, something that fits this type of product. Now our car is of course on a level 100 times higher than the normal Porsche. We're talking 900 horsepower, and an electronically limited top speed of 340 kilometers per hour.
was mich What continues to really excite and motivate me personally is that when you followed something from its development to the end and you've often worn yourself out in the process everybody else sees the finished project but the path that leads you there is often not so easy and straightforward filled with problems and challenges and then it's finished and you stand in front of it or you see the first photos that the folks in marketing have made and then you often think and that's what still motivates me even when we're already working on new projects with all their challenges it continues to motivate me it's all about the feeling wow that is one fantastic car this is really an outstanding product and you also think yeah Exactly. Wouldn't change a thing. Of course, you've seen the prototype while the car is being built. You've seen it drive past on the test track. Of course, I received tons of photos from you while you were building it. Plenty of updates. And still, that moment when you stand between the white and the black car, and they're finally finished. <laughs> there they are. Huge off-road monsters. And naturally, I don't only see the finished car, but also the team's effort and performance that's necessary until there's a finished product like that. And for me, that was Fuerteventura. When I arrived after a 45-minute ride through the, the stony desert, you know, it was surrounding us. And I just stood there. And I thought, this is really impressive. That's really... Wow, guys. I have to be very careful with the gas pedal because it's unbelievably... The turbos catch very quickly and you can also hear it. How we're discharging air periodically and the car reacts in a very refined way. I mean, seriously, we're driving a six-wheeled car with three axles and how much weight? Empty 3.4 tons, permissible total weight 4.5. Now, if you told me I was driving a sports car, I'd say, yeah, that checks out. Passed. In this car, you don't have the feeling that you're way over three tons and have a third axle. Instead, you think you're driving a G63. This car is so agile, and it's only when I look in the mirror that I notice there's an extra axle. And I find that fascinating. And that's the art of keeping the car agile enough to be comfortable for the driver. I'm standing there in Fuerteventura in the dust and wondering how my father would have reacted to the 6x6. And I think he would have simply said, guys, give me the keys, I'm going to be out for two days. But there's another car, his absolute favorite that he drove for many, many years, always in the same color, in black, the SL. Do you think your father, if we had put the SL, the Bodo Buschmann edition Brabus 750 based on the SL63, what would have happened if we had handed him the keys and said, here, we have something for you? That's really, that's simply. Starting with the quilting, there's a funny story when you talk about quilting designs. Today, they all have wonderful names like seashell diamond, rocket design, and all sorts of things. In the past, sorry to say, we simply called it by the brand name, Ritter Sport, like the chocolate. We didn't mean to, but it best described the square pattern. You had these 2x2 two two centimeter squares, and they were exactly like the design of the chocolate bar. That's how everyone knew it back then. What type of interior should we go for? Back then you said, yeah, go for the Ritter Sport design. Black leather with this and that quilting. And now we interpret it a little differently. Today it has a partial perforation, so of course it's all been modernized. But it's still pretty much the same as the original Bodo Bushman car. We build an incredible number of cars. We're busy all the time. 
and there are normal projects, and then there are some very special ones. There are photos you never forget after seeing them for the first time. And one of these shows my father on the A31 in a leather jacket driving the SL without the hood, sunglasses on, hair flying. Everything that defines Brabus is in that photo. And to this day, it is one of my absolute all-time favorites. When I came to the shoot and found out that the guys had just removed the hood from the new SL in order to recreate the photo, I honestly needed a moment. We simply asked ourselves the question, how can we honor our founder, my father? And how can we say thank you for building the 40-year foundation we work on today? And how can I acknowledge five years of next generation Brabus, as well as five years as CEO at Brabus? How can we convey all that without me having to talk about it? And still, when the time comes and you sit there and realize five years have come and gone, and this product is in front of you, and you're about to present it to the public, I naturally paused for a moment, even sitting in the audience at the signature night, and said, okay, how? How did all this happen? What happened? That's a longer story. I was the Techno Classica, a trade fair for classic automobiles for those who might not know. And Bodo Bushman called me in the morning and said, Sven, can you come outside for a minute? I can't park my car. I thought, wait a moment. Yeah, I'm not feeling well. I have a headache. Fine, I'll come out. No problem. I parked the car. He looked really bad. I sent him away. Oli Goffrey was there too. I said, Bodo, go home. You don't look good. Go to the doctor. And a few days later, we got the call from Stefan Hoster saying that Bodo Bushman wasn't doing well. But I'd rather skip the details for now. And then sitting together in the office with Oli Goffrey and Konstantin, all four of us just looked at each other. Jörn joined us a bit later. I wasn't in the office that day. I had the day off and was at the Nürburgring and received the call in the morning from Uli Goffrey that Bodo had passed. I have to say, it wasn't easy. It was a huge shock for the whole company. And, of course, a shock for the family, no question. Because we knew, well, I knew a few more details than most of the others. We knew what had happened because, more or less from one day to the next, he didn't show up for work. And he was always there. We all thought, that's not good. First, I was sorry for Konstantin. He was his father. And second, when there's someone that close, I mean, I didn't start working here yesterday. You have a very, very close relationship to people. And in this case, we saw each other every day. Well, not literally. Weekends were off from time to time. You needed a moment to absorb it all. It was a deep shock for all the employees. I remember on the same day, quite a few called me, and I had grown men crying on the phone. So it wasn't easy, really not easy. What was great was that the family, Konstantin, his sisters, his mother, stood up and said loud and clear in front of the employees, listen, everything's fine. It's a difficult situation, but we're going to continue here in Bodo's style. If I could have a conversation with him now, what would it be like? Because now it would be two people meeting significantly closer to eye level than they were at that time when he was still alive. Well, I won't be getting that opportunity. And still, I sometimes think, maybe he's sitting up there on a cloud, laughing his head off, saying, see, I told you, things can get pretty complicated. But that we'll never know. Exactly. That car stands for much more than just, we built a car the way Bodo Buschmann would have wanted it. Instead, as you said, the last five years of the company's development is in that car. Absolutely. 